What a joy it is to gather with God's people, something never to be taken for granted. What a joy it is to sing these songs together. Where else do you find people gathering and singing together and not just singing for their own uh, entertainment or some, some sort of collegiality with others, but, but to sing vertically, to exalt the Lord, to praise Him. What a blessing it is, something that just becomes routine. Undoubtedly, something that is just part of the rhythm of our week, but something to always give God thanks for. Just to to be thankful to him for his providence that uh, he woke us up this morning and he brought us here with God's people to sing his praises, to be in his word. And it, it always amazes me in talking with people, I'll hear stories about how Uh, People will come to church on Sunday morning and they'll have an interaction with somebody who uh, very precisely lifts up their spirit or very precisely speaks into a challenging situation or brings conviction of sin. Just all the ways that the spirit is at work among us as we are gathered here today. So we just give God praise for his grace corporately and individually. If you would go with me in your Bibles to Exodus 22, Uh, our passage for today will run from, uh, well, as a whole is 22.18 to 23.9. So if you'll just turn there with me. As Christians, one of the most central beliefs that we hold is that God is holy. If you were to sort of figure out what are the the top three or what are the top five truths, propositional statements that form the bedrock, the basis of Christianity, we would say that this statement is at the very center. God is holy. He is set apart, distinct, perfect, and pure. But I think what we need to be reminded of continually is that this is not merely some theological truth that we affirm, some theological truth that we hold up as important, some proposition that we assent to. Instead, to call God holy, to worship God as holy, to spread his renown as holy, is to live a certain kind of life. Uh, It's not merely to use words, maybe empty words, vain words. It's not merely to say something or affirm something. It is to live a certain kind of life. A life that reflects him. A life that puts his holy character on display. God's holiness shining forth from the holiness of his people. In other words, saying that God is holy means being his holy people. This is how we confess this theological truth. And we find this all throughout Scripture, but let me give you just a, a couple of instances here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. This was our parallel passage last week. The Apostle Peter says, As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So God's character, God's nature, God as holy bears in on the everyday practical life, the attitude, the mindset, the thinking of the person who calls God holy so that the life actually matches that belief or profession. 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 to 6, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. God's light reflected in the light that we have as God's people. Reflecting his glory. Reflecting his holiness. This morning... We return to the legal material in Exodus following the Ten Commandments. And the title for the sermon today is A Holy People, Part 2. So we had part one last week. This week 
we look at part two, a holy people. And we're in that material, as I've said week in and week out, we're in that material right after the Ten Commandments. So we get the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and those are the overarching uh, principles of God's law. Those are the great pillars. But what we find is that under each of those commands, we have all sorts of practical situations, practical scenarios, and rules or judgments as, uh, as it is translated at the beginning of chapter 21, we, we have all of these little commands that fit under those big commandments. And that's the material that we're in now as we look at chapters 21 to 23. And this material in these three chapters is called the Book of the Covenant. And you could see it as a practical explication of the Ten Commandments. Last week, we started looking at a series of laws that at first glance appear randomly grouped together. And in fact, as I said, when you look at certain English translations, you'll get sundry laws or various laws. These laws just sort of listed as being quite distinct in chapter 22, verse 18 to 23, 9. And it does seem that way. It does seem kind of meshed together, these random laws. It moves from sorcery and bestiality to oppression of widows and orphans, to offering God the firstborn and the first fruits, and, and what you're not to eat, and what the Israelites were not to eat. And it moves from that to lawsuits, bribes, and rescuing an enemy's donkey. So this is a lot of ground, it's a lot of terrain, a very different kinds of laws dealing with very different sorts of things. But at the heart of all of this, stands God's character and Israel's consecration. They are to be set apart from the surrounding nations. And we talked last week about particularly sorcery and bestiality as they front the list, how those were practices that took place among the Canaanites, among all of the ghastly practices of the Canaanites for which God was going to bring the judgment of the sword from his people. We find those heading the list and Israel is to be distinct. They are to be separate from all of these surrounding nations and from all of their practices. They are to be entirely devoted to Yahweh. In all their ways, they are to reflect his compassion and his justice. In other words, they are to be holy as God is holy. Uh, And in that sense, what we find in This passage, what we find in all of these various laws, is something very similar to what we find in 1 Peter chapter 1. Be holy, for God is holy. Be compassionate, for God is compassionate. Be just, for God is just. And we can group these laws into four categories. And these were the four points introduced last week. And so you'll see those on the screen there. We looked at the first two last week, rejection of wickedness in verses 18 to 27, and then devotion to God, verses 28 to 31, as we finished up the end of chapter 22. And today we're going to look at the latter two, so justice for all, verses 1 to 3 of chapter 23, and then verses 6 to 9, and then finally love for enemies in verses 4 to 5. Last week, uh, we considered... Everything up through verse 31. Uh, The idea that we are as God's people, Israel as God's people, was to reject all forms of wickedness. And it reminds us of Romans chapter 12, as I cited verse 1 last week, that we're not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. By, By who? By God's Holy Spirit. So God's Holy Spirit transforms our minds keeps us from the world and makes us more and more like our Redeemer. And then we talked about devotion to God as we looked at the first fruits and the firstborn. And one of the things I threw out there is, are we giving God the very best or are we giving God our scraps? That's the sort of thing that we're meant to ask ourselves as we consider these offerings from the fullness of the produce that Israel was required to give to the Lord. 
And as we go through these laws, there, there are sort of two things that are always happening to us as we, as we read through these laws. All the legal material that we're, that we're in, and we've been in, in this material for quite some time. Two things are always happening to us or should be happening to us or in us. The first is that we should be constantly confronted with our own inability to keep these laws perfectly. We are constantly running up against the fact that we don't do what God commands us to do, what God commands his people to do, and that we do the things that God tells us we ought not to do, that we do not meet God's standard, that we fall short of his glory, as Paul says in Romans 3. And that drives us to consider the wonder and the beauty and the glory of the cross. That that God sent his son to pay the penalty for our sins. That although we are lawbreakers, Christ is the law keeper. He died in our place. He kept the law perfectly in our stead. Died in our place. And now through his righteousness given to our account, we are made right with God. So we're, we're constantly, that's, that, that's constantly at work in our souls as we're thinking about our inability to keep this law and our need for Christ as our Savior. But there's a corollary to that that's, that should be always happening in our souls. And it is this recognition that, that if God sent his son to die for us and if Christ took our place on the cross, and if Christ has given us his Holy Spirit and the life of Christ is in us, then we are to be those who live this kind of life from the heart. We are kingdom citizens. So it is not enough to simply say, yes, Christ took my place Yes, I am a lawbreaker, but praise God that Christ was a law keeper. But we must make the transition. Or we must move out of that. We must go out from the cross, recognizing the fact that we are now to live cross-shaped lives, empowered by the Holy Spirit of Christ. And so in that sense, there is always the, the comfort of Christ's cross and always the conviction that Christ's cross brings to us as we live out life in him. And these two things are constantly happening as we read through God's holy law. So if you would stand with me as we read together. And we're going to read the whole passage that we started last week. So chapter 22, verse 18 Up through 23, verse 9. This is the word of the Lord. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him and you shall not exact interest from him. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak in pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body. And what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. You shall be consecrated to me, therefore you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. You shall not spread a false report. This is our passage for today. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many so as to pervert justice. Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. 
If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in his lawsuit. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. And you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You can go ahead and be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask for his help as we seek to understand and apply his word. Father, we are so grateful for another opportunity to be together as your people. Lord, we praise you for scripture. We praise you that through it, you fully equip us for every good work. Through it, you show us the glory and beauty of our Savior so that we can behold him. And through beholding him, we can be transformed into his glorious likeness. Father, we thank you that you bring us together to be in your word, not alone, but with our brothers and sisters, that we are a family. And God, we praise you that you have given us one another as a great gift to help us to stay on the path, to help us to refrain from sin, to help us to draw strength from the Spirit, to help us look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Father, we are greatly in need of your many helps. And so we pray today that you would strengthen us for this walk with you. And as we go through the coming week, Lord, that you would impress deeply upon our hearts what we have before us this morning in your word. And that it would empower us this week. It would strengthen us. It would remind us and spur us on, giving us zeal to live for your glory. Father, we thank you that we now can... Come before you and study. So we pray that you would enlighten our minds, that you would inflame our hearts and fill our lives with your faith, hope, and love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at these last two this morning, justice for all and love for enemies. All of these hanging together as uh, associated with the holiness of God. That this is what it looks like to be God's holy People. So look with me at verses 1 to 3, and we're also going to read verses 6 to 9. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many, so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. And then drop down with me to verse 6. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in his lawsuit. Keep keep far from a false charge. And do not kill the innocent and righteous. For I will not acquit the wicked. And you shall take no bribe. For a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner. For you were sojourners in the land of Egypt, or aliens. Uh, And any time today that you say the word alien, it means something very different. Uh, But it's a foreigner who is sojourning in the land. The big idea here is clear. Justice. That is the theme of these verses. And particularly justice as it is officially administered throughout Israel. So this is uh, the language of the administration of justice from the top down, from the leadership of the people. So think of in the future as Israel, as the history of Israel will unfold. Think of priests and judges, the high priest. Think of kings and others. Everywhere we look here in these verses, we see the language of the law court. We have witnesses, lawsuits, and bribes. God is giving laws to ensure justice within Israel. As God is just, 
As we see in verse 7, I will not acquit the wicked, so too must his people be just. They must reflect his justice. Holiness demands justice. And this is the same sort of thing that we saw last week. As uh, in our verses from last week, God stated that he is compassionate. And so God's people are to be compassionate to the vulnerable, to the marginalized. They're orphans and widows and those who are impoverished. Why? Why are we to be compassionate, merciful, kind-hearted, tender-hearted people? Because God is compassionate. And the same is true here as we reflect his holy character in our pursuit of justice. And throughout these verses, the concern is that justice not be twisted or perverted. So in verse 2, you get this language of to pervert justice. And then in verse 6, you shall not pervert the justice due. In verse 8, a bribe subverts the cause of those who are in the right. So all of this language of, of justice and, and justice being twisted or uprooted or perverted. And what we find as we move through this legal material is that justice can be perverted in two major ways. Ways And there are, uh, we recognize, many instances of injustice, many ways that injustice can infect a society or infect a government or infect a church or a family or an individual life. But here we get these two major ways, and probably what we will find when we find injustice is that it goes back to one of these two. So here they are, two ways that Justice can be perverted, one, through perjury, and two, through partiality. So we're going to take some time to look at both of those. So first, perjury. Justice can be perverted through perjury. Here we are back at the ninth commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So we're meant to understand as we read this material uh, that it's situated under the ninth commandment. If you were to go through all of this legal material and try to kind of find which bucket to put it in and you had 10 buckets, this would go in the ninth bucket. This is in the bucket saying you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is one of the chief ways that injustice prevails. Lies. And specifically, lies that do damage to other people. And we see this in verse 1 and verse 7. Verse 1, you shall not spread a false report. This is a lie. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. Do you see how the false report is not just dangling in midair as though it's just a falsehood or a lie, but it is a lie that damages another human being. And you'll remember uh, a few sermons ago, we had these harm scenarios, these situations where individuals can, can be harmed bodily and in some cases unto death. Well, here we get ways in which an individual's name or reputation or their body through uh, the consequences of that false report, they can be harmed through these false accusations, these malicious testimonies. Verse 7, keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. In both cases, we see official lies, witnesses giving a false report, members of society falsely accusing their neighbors of crimes they did not commit. Such false reports and false charges can result in the execution of the innocent and righteous. And that's what's going on here. A false report is brought forward. False witnesses stand before a judge or a jury and the result may be that the innocent or the righteous are put to death. They are killed. In God's sight, this is a heinous crime that brings his judgment. And we see this in a couple of other places in the law. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. And you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Now, isn't that interesting the way that is stated? You shall not do these things. You shall do these things. And then God says, I am the Lord. And what God is saying in that is, you belong to me. You are my people. 
and you are to reflect me, to be like me, and to spread false reports, to be involved in false charges, to slander our neighbor, is to be the opposite of the Lord. It is to run contrary to the Lord. It is to fall in league with the author of lies, Satan himself. We see a very practical outworking of this in Deuteronomy 19, verses 15 to 21. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. So more than one witness must be brought forward according to God's law. And we recognize why that is the case. One witness could easily pervert justice. If you have two or three, it becomes much less likely that a false report or a false charge will prevail. And then it goes on to say this. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently. And I think this would involve investigation on their part and prayer unto the Lord. And if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. Now that's justice. And we all recognize that's just. When we see that in a movie or we read that in a book, we're like, yes, right? There's an impulse, and that's because we are made in God's image. Even quite apart from being believers, even quite apart from being Christians, we are made in God's image. So even those who do not know God, when they see that in a carefully crafted story, whether through film or through a novel or whatever, when that happens, that sort of justice occurs. There is this celebration in the soul. It goes on to say, so you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. That's interesting. We, we, we didn't always think pity, mercy is a good thing. Here the Lord says, no, you must not, your eyes must not be overshadowed by pity. But you must carry out this justice on the person who has falsely accused another. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So before we go on to partiality, let me just step back for a moment as we think about this perjury. And just make a few observations that I think are important here. First, notice how the death penalty is held together with vindicating the innocent and the righteous. I just want to say this. This is really important for us as we dialogue with unbelievers and as we talk about Christian positions on issues. It's important for us to recognize that God's justice, God's holy law, recognizes that punishing the wicked and vindicating the innocent are equally important to the Lord. It is equally heinous when a society does not, in accord with Genesis 9, put to death a murderer. It is equally heinous when we put to death one who is falsely accused and is innocent. So what some will say is, well, the fact that we would ever or could ever potentially put to death an innocent person means that we should never put to death anybody. We, of course, recognize that that is not justice. Justice demands That murderers be executed and justice demands that an innocent person never be put to death. And it it just reminds us of the great onus of responsibility, the great burden and load of responsibility that rests on the shoulders of those who are involved in the administration of justice in a society. Law enforcement and prosecutors and those who are judges 
and all others, and all of us as jurors, if we are ever called for jury duty. This is what it looks like for justice to prevail, that both of these must be weighed together. A second thing to consider here, notice how integral truth is to justice. Injustice prevails where lies prevail. So uh, upholding justice while not upholding truth is in the end to subvert justice. Justice will always be perverted where the truth of the matter is not upheld. And then a third observation or implication for us. I think this portion, these two verses, cause us to consider all the small ways that we do this sort of thing in our speech to slander other people. Now, it, maybe it's the case that it, this room gathered as believers, you, you would say, well, you know, I, I haven't like, outright slandered anyone recently. You can't think of a conversation you've had where you started to smear someone. But here's the thing that often happens. It's the way in which we omit truthful information and the way in which we exaggerate the situation that perverts the perception that other people have of another person. There are all kinds of little ways that the result is that, that we tear down the reputation of another person. We slander another person. Maybe by offering a criticism, by not balancing it, that with something that casts more positive light on that person. Or by exaggerating a statement that someone made. Or exaggerating an attitude that someone had. There are many ways in which we do this. And if we are honest with ourselves, this is one of those things like coveting, where you, you just keep, keep going deeper and deeper and deeper, and you just find all the ways that this in reality has happened in the last 24 hours. And once again, it reminds us of our great need for a Savior and our great need for the Spirit. To help us day by day as we read God's word, as we meditate on his truth, as we pray to God without ceasing, asking for his help to live a life that is very contrary to the way of this world. And the way of our old self, which we drag with us through life. A second way that justice is perverted is through partiality. So we see justice perverted through perjury, and now we see it perverted through partiality or favoritism or prejudice. These things rob justice from some by favoring others. And I, I, love, this, I love this passage because it, it's, it's so multifaceted. Here we get various forms of partiality. So we're going to go through each of them. So first... We can do things in favor of the majority. In favor of the majority. Look at verse 2. You shall, not, you shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many so as to pervert justice. And, and by the way, as we're thinking through each of these, uh, this has its center in the law court. So this is official kind of stuff, but, but it, it trickles down into our interactions with individual people. Uh, this has to do with all of our interactions with other human beings, falling in line with the many. Partiality towards the majority and against the minority. And I think this just speaks to the power of popularity, right? The power of popularity. This is not just for high school, right? It's not just in middle school and high school. I think this happens, you know, somewhere around middle school. It's like you're just charging along as a kid, playing kickball, picking your nose, you know, got the cow lick in the back. You just don't care, and you're just living life. And then all of a sudden, middle school. 
And then it's like things just start changing. You just start thinking about you know, how people perceive you and your image and, and who you know and who you don't know. All these things just start happening in the mind. And popularity can become an incredible idol. But we need to understand that this doesn't just get dropped off when you graduate from high school. This is not something you just charge through middle school years and high school years with a concern about. And then you just move on with life. This is the sort of thing that is a part of being human. That we, we go through life liking it when more people like us than those who don't. All right, this stack needs to be really high. And, and this stack just doesn't need to exist at all. And if it does exist, it needs to be quite tiny. We love to be loved. We love to be liked. We love to be popular, whether it is in our spheres of influence and small group, uh, within our, our team, at work, whatever it is. It's not just the politicians who are taking polls. It's every human being. So we recognize the great power of popularity and how that can pervert justice. We also recognize uh, the reality of embarrassment. We hate to be embarrassed. We hate to be in a situation where everyone in the room says one thing and we say another. All of a sudden we start shrinking. We become very tiny, very small, very ashamed, very embarrassed. When we think about partiality towards the majority, we are talking about a lack of courage. The one thing that it takes to stand up for what is right in the midst of the many who are not standing up for what is right is courage. And it's the kind of courage that can only come from the Lord. It's the kind of courage that stands in the face of wrongdoing, stands in the face of justice perverted. And even if you're the only one, which as Christians, this is the way of it. That even if you're the only one in the office, in the company, the only one in your family, the only one on vacation, the only one fill in the blank that we have the courage from the Lord to stand up for what is right, what is true, what is just, no matter what they say. That's what we see here in favor of the majority in verse 2. Then it moves to partiality in favor of the poor, verse 3. And this one might be a little surprising to you. Nor shall you be partial. Well, it's not surprising, but it flies in the face of a lot of contemporary thinking. Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. Well, the last one's kind of obvious, even though we don't like it because we like popularity. We don't like to be embarrassed. We don't like to be in the minority. We don't like to be small. But this one seems uh, maybe a little bit of a, a shocker. This is one you kind of trip over. And you think about it for a moment, you realize, oh yeah, of course. But, but it's one that it causes you to pause as you're reading through the text. You shall not be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. You know, it seems good on the surface to favor the poor in a situation. Think of a situation in, a, in the law court, a, a, a situation of justice. It seems on the surface to be a virtuous thing, to be a good thing, to see the poor man as a poor man and to lean into him, to favor him, to go to his side, to get in his or her corner. And of course, we recognize the need to, to vindicate the poor and to help the poor and to, to be there for the needy. It's all throughout Scripture. But what we are talking about here is a situation involving justice in a court and while it would seem good on the surface to favor the poor, it is ultimately unjust and therefore unholy. And the reason for that is that it allows sympathy to overshadow truth. And, and what we got before is when popularity overshadows truth. Do you see the way that can happen? 
There's the truth of the situation. There are the facts of the case. There's what actually happened. And that just gets overshadowed by popularity because we want to be liked. And here we see sympathy overshadowing justice, overshadowing truth. Notice this. This is important. Neither of those are praiseworthy. Neither of these are right and good in God's sight, in God's justice. The reason why uh, Lady Justice is depicted with a blindfold on, right? She's, she does not see. Of course, we know that that does not work out in real life. But she does not see. There are, there are the scales. There are the facts. There is truth. It's a great ideal. But it comes only in truth through Christ. It's the only way it will show up truly in our society. So we see partiality in favor of the majority, in favor of the poor. And then in verses 6 to 8, we see partiality in favor of the rich. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in his lawsuit. And you shall take no bribe. This is verse 8. For a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. Here we see it. The table's turned. This is the more normal way it goes down, right? This is, this is the way it typically goes down, and that is partiality to the guy with the fat bank account, partiality to the guy with the Ferrari, partiality to the guy uh, who has an exotic beach house, whatever it is, partiality to the person who is a political figure within the local town or a political figure in the state or just go on up. Partiality toward the person who is rich in the things of this world. That's typically how it goes down. The issue here is the idol of self. And that really is the issue in all of these. It is the idol of self. The rich are favored because of what they can do for me. Right? We don't favor the rich simply for favoring the rich. Well, we don't gravitate toward them just uh, because we, we, just see, we, we just see their sparkles or whatever in this life. That's not the case. We gravitate towards the rich. We show partiality towards the rich and against the poor because of what the rich can do for us. And that's the reason why bribes are mentioned here. Bribes given from the rich. These gifts, these subtle bribes given in order that justice might, that, that, that lady justice might pull up a corner of that blindfold and peek a little bit. And lean in one direction over the other. That's what's going on here. Let me ask this question to you. How do you treat those who can do nothing for you in return? How do you treat that person you meet randomly? They can do absolutely nothing for your reputation. No one's watching. And this person, who are they? They're, they don't know anyone you know. They don't have anything you want. They can do absolutely nothing to enhance your life, to, to cause you to have forward progress to, to help you have upward mobility. They can do nothing at all for you. Do you treat that person in the same way that you treat the person who can do much for you? Much for your bank account. Much for your career. Much for your reputation. Much for your renown. That's what's in view here. Not partiality toward those who can puff us up. And give us more but justice. Justice officially and justice personally. I'll remind you of a verse from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, which every single person in our society, every person in this room should hear loudly. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves 
with many pangs. You know, in a group this size, I just need to ask, in what ways are you, through love of money, wandering away from the faith? Just loving stuff. Loving all the ways that you can just make progress in this life and have more in this life. Hear the words of the apostle. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. On this road are many injustices. Many injustices personally, many injustices in the way that you relate to others, in your job, in your family, everywhere. The road paved with love of money is a road filled with many, many injustices to people made in God's image. So we see that partiality in favor of the rich, which is really in favor of self. And then finally, we see partiality in favor of the native. Verse 9, you shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. This is justice for insiders as well as outsiders. This is justice for all people. This is justice for believers and for unbelievers. This is justice for people who are in the know and those who aren't need to know. This is justice for people in your sphere of influence and who are among your friends and for those whom you have never met. And here we see in the case of Israel that God reminds them that they were sojourners in the land of Egypt to remember back to the way you were. And this this tells us that there is quite a role for sympathy as we think sympathy or empathy as we think about the Christian life. We are to consider what it is like to be in the shoes of others. You you were like that. Think about this Consider all the ways that God has given you experiences in your life so that you can have this kind of sympathy to, towards your neighbor. All, all, the, all the ways that God's brought you through difficult times, difficult circumstances. And then we run into situations with other people and it's just no sympathy. The Lord reminds his people, remember how you were in that state and I rescued you, I brought you out. Let that fill your mind. As you relate to others. So we see here number three. Justice for all. Verses one to three and six to nine. Now we move to love for enemies. As we finish up this section. So for that let's look at verses four to five. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray. You shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden. You shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. You know, at first glance, these verses seem misplaced. Uh, they, they seem just out of place. You're, you know, and even there on the outline, one to three, and then you got to drop down to six to nine to finish the same theme. So what's going on here? Why do we have this material on relating to enemies sandwiched between all of this stuff about justice and law courts? It really just seems out of place. And so you get, you know, biblical scholars that kind of go through and say, well, this was, this was added by a later redactor. You know, they do all that sort of stuff with these sorts of text. Rather than looking at the way in which it relates to the section around it. There's such a, there's, among biblical scholars, there's such a quick jump. To just say, well, this is a a later redaction. This is the product of someone who came along later and and this material just kind of got smushed together and so forth. And then they just move on. And then the college student sitting in uh, Old Testament introduction at the university of whatever is like, man, can I trust my Bible? You just fall apart and just crumble. And I think that's one of the things that we, we really want to be about here at Four Corners. And Trey, Trey and I have talked about it. Ways that we can strengthen our teenagers to understand that when they sit in Philosophy 101 or Old Testament intro or New Testament intro, uh, when they go off to college, that they're equipped 
with the information that will help them think clearly and rightly about all of these sorts of issues. But as we look at these passages, this, these verses, upon closer inspection, we realize that this material is not out of place at all. The theme is justice and truth. So think about this for a moment. The theme is justice and truth. It is doing what is right unto others, irrespective of how you feel about them or what they can do for you. That's what's in view. And in that sense, a person's enemy is the very best test case for justice. There really is no better training ground or test case for determining if justice is really at play, if it's really functioning, than when we're dealing with enemies. Will you do what is right to someone who will certainly not repay you? Because they hate you. Will you do what is right to someone whom you have no affinity for. You try. Maybe you try. I, I try to like them. I've tried and I've tried. And of course we're dealing with our heart and we're praying and all of that. But you just don't have, the, the natural affinities are not there. Just connectivity not happening. Will you do what is right for that person? Will you operate based on what is true and right or based on how you feel? Uh, feelings have become God in our society today. This is about how you feel. You just sit around and introspect yourself into a, to a fit. It's just, it's just all about how I feel. What are my feelings? I'm just, I'm not feeling. And so everybody, there's such a therapeutic culture surrounding this. And the psychiatrists just love it. It's just feelings and feelings and feelings. And what am I feeling? And I don't know about my feelings. And I felt different yesterday than I feel today. I wonder how I'm going to feel tomorrow. So we just operate all out of our feelings. Where do we find this in the Christian worldview? This is not from the Lord. This is something altogether different. We operate based on what is right, based on what is true, not based on the flights of feeling, temporary emotion. So I think that's the connection to the surrounding verses. This is a, a test case for what it means to do what is right and true, irrespective of how you feel or what you can gain. Justice for all and love of enemies are wedded together in this sense. So here we get one example showing that Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount was a true explication of the Old Testament law. You know, some people like to think of the Sermon on the Mount as sort of the new law, it was all there. It was all there. We were going through the Sermon on the Mount, and we were looking at Jesus' teaching. What we see is Jesus is, is trying to subvert the rabbinical teaching that was tradition, the traditions of men. And he was pointing people back to the essence and the substance of God's holy and true law. As the great law keeper, as the great explicator of the law, Jesus was pointing people back to the truth of it. And that's what we have going on in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says this in Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? I love, I love the teaching of Christ as he, he really just gets to the heart of the matter. He's so, so logical. If you love people who love you, why are you patting yourself on the back? Well, of course you do. But they like you too. He's saying, even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Wicked sinners who know nothing of God or his truth or his justice pat other people on the shoulder who pat them on the shoulder. That's just normal. Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is calling his disciples to live out Exodus 23, verses 4 to 5 from the heart. 
Now, Jesus is teaching the law here. He's saying, love of enemies. We think, oh, this is new. This is great. The teaching of Christ. Mm, no, it was there. It's right here. Exodus 23, verses 4 to 5. That's what we have. This love of enemies, however, does not stay in the heart. You know, we could read Jesus' teaching and say it's about the heart. It's all about the heart. Sometimes people say that. I don't know what they mean. I think they might mean it's about feelings. It's about what's on the inside. The, the heart always shows up in our actions. Where your heart is there, your treasure will be also. What we believe in our hearts, what we love in our hearts, shows up in our steps. It's always there. Love of enemies does not stay in the heart. It shows up in practical ways. And even here in Exodus 23, we get some practical ways. Here, a straying ox or donkey is brought back. A pressed down donkey is relieved of its burden. The enemy's property is regarded as one's own property. As Jesus says in Matthew 7, Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Even your enemies. Would you want someone to lift that burden off of your domestic animal? Think, think as an Israelite. Yeah. That'd be helpful. Then do it for them. This is what Jesus' teaching was. And it was there in the Old Testament. Let me say this to us as we close this morning. This is one of the great tests of Christian discipleship. Because this is where it hurts most. This is where the rubber really beats the road. How do we treat those who hate us and mistreat us. This is where living for Christ, walking in the Spirit, loving Jesus, really shows up. And what about in the public square? Yes, with all the craziness online, all the blogs and all the podcasts and all the comments, right? All the biting Stinging, threatening, malicious, hateful comments by Christians. What a sad case. What a drinking in of the world, being conformed to the world just like everybody else. Hate them just like everybody else. Curse them just like everybody else. Talk about how awful they are just like everybody else. That's what the world does. We are Christians. Yes, we fight for truth and justice in the public square. But are the voices of Christians heard cursing their public enemies or praying for them? We recognize, of course, that we have to stand up for the truth. But this always has to be done in this way. Right? Or it ceases to be Christian. We can fight for the life of the unborn. We can fight for sexual purity. We can fight for distinctions between male and female. We can fight for all kinds of things in the public square. But we never do it divorced from this reality that those with whom we engage, even if they are our enemies, must be loved. This brings us back to our Lord and Savior on the cross. This brings us back to Jesus. Luke chapter 23. Verse 34. Listen to Christ. He prays on the cross. He has been beaten. He has been scourged. He has had his hair plucked out of his head and his beard. He's been mocked in every cruel way. Spit upon he has had nails driven through his wrists and his feet. And he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, we talk a lot about Christ-centered and cross-centered. And in the last ten years, there's been a whole lot of language like that. And we have it in our vision. Centering on Christ. And we mean it. But let me ask you this. 
Does this attitude towards our enemies impact the way we define what it means to be Christ-centered? What it means to be cross-centered? Anyone who's cross-centered is hearing, reverberating in their ears these words. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This love of enemies is ringing in the ears of every cross-centered life. Not hatred of enemies. Not malice towards enemies. Not tearing down enemies. But as we see here, removing the burden from the donkey, bringing back that straying ox, that straying donkey. This is love of enemies enemies. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you would lock it into our hearts by your spirit, that you would help us to be faithful in carrying it out. Lord, we thank you for your grace given to us at the cross. We thank you for the life that you have empowered us to live. And we pray that you would keep our focus on this Redeemer, on the fact that we have been rescued out of bondage and we have been purchased for a new kind of life, a life in which Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We pray that that would be our life song. Lord, help us. Go with us as we move into the rest of this service and this week. Lord, would you use this time celebrating the Lord's Supper to bring comfort and encouragement. We thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen.